Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another Secret Sunday session. Today, we are going to hear from Tom and to hear his story. And so I'm going to stop talking so that we can switch it over to Tom because it is all about him in this session. So welcome, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us on this visual podcast today. Yeah, thank you. I suppose the uh, the first like seven years or six years of my professional life, it was all about me being an AFL footballer. You tend to think the world revolves around you, but I must say, since getting married and having a child, um, this is nice. It's nice to have something about you again. <laughs> really different with a baby on board. Yeah, oh, it would for sure. And and switching definitely roles, as you said, of being, you know, almost selfish in a way, because when you're, even I know, not having kids and not having a family, it is all about me and my lifestyle to then changing that. Um, but I want to take you back to those um, initial moments of your life when you did start playing AFL for those people that, are not aware or don't watch AFL, which is weird if you live in Australia. Um, who are you and what? what's a little bit of background about your playing career? Yeah, I mean, I suppose for the ultimate context, I mean, the AFL is the biggest sporting um, code in Australia by a few streets now. Um, the NRL and the AFL sort of used to kind of go head to head with the AFL sort of being the bigger brother. But um, in the recent years, the AFL's expansion has been quite rapid. So um, you know, my initial sort of foray into sport was much like anyone else in terms of just loving playing it as a junior. Uh, and I think, you know, being passionate about sport is a great way to overcome injuries or form issues or even in Australian sport, the politics that run through these sort of elite talent pathways that the, the juniors go through. And the other thing that seemed to really help me was, um, though it's been difficult to display to everyone over the last couple of years, I'm actually six foot seven. Um and I grew a foot in prep. So by the end of my first year of school, I was actually the tallest kid in the school. Um, and that sort of genuinely helped me from a uh, athletic advantage point of view as the years progressed. Uh, and then look, once you sort of accelerate through the ranks, um, you know, more training, more pressure, more competition uh, until the age of 18, where you get the chance to obviously be drafted and, you know, after being selected as the state captain in, in the under 16s in 2011 for Victoria, I thought there was a real opportunity obviously to play at the top level, but you know, it was a really tough couple of years trying to make sure that my performance was up to scratch and eventually getting drafted at, at number one overall. And I think, you know, one of the, the great um, things that people in Australia, I'd say don't understand particularly is just the, I would say the mental weight of being a professional athlete. It does seem really easy, and I would actually say, you know, in defense of that sort of general uh, generalist argument, I'd say that the, the footballing public have that that sport is easy is that 95% of it is. 95% uh, of it is very structured. It's very turn up, do this, do that, exercise, fitness, travel, you know, plenty of people wanting to get to know. Like there's lots of great things about playing sport professionally in Australia in particular. But that 5% being your exposure to, you know, scrutiny beyond um, what anyone else faces. I think the exposure of, you know, trying to find who you are at the age of 18 and having to find that very quickly with a lot of people depending on you. Um, and also I'd say just working out how to perform at your absolute best amongst the sort of bright lights of the footballing public at such a young age certainly provide uh, challenging experiences at different stages. Mm. And, and looking at that, like you were drafted at such a young age and and an added pressure as well to be number one pick. Do you yep. think you were ready at that age? Yeah, I mean, it's always hard to say. Uh, you don't really have a choice either, right? I mean, there's this age old like conversation in the AFL is like, if you were picked number two, no one would have cared. Um, mm -hmm. And that's certainly the case. I mean, being pick one is a, is a very special and, um, you know, I, I do consider it very proud moment in my career because there's you know tens of thousands of kids who try and get drafted every single year and to go first is is something that I, well for for starters I wanted to to accomplish and for two um I'm very proud that I was able to do so but I think mm -hmm. what's probably unspoken about the transition in terms of entering the league and it's different for every player so it depends if you obviously leave your home state depends if you have to you know move out of home it depends sort of what your schooling experience was like to your point earlier in the question, it depends what age you're drafted as well. But for me, I mean, within 10 days of my final school exam, I was starting pre-season in Sydney. Um, and, you know, you walk out of school and you're sort of all happy and you've just, you know, done the thing that you've been working at for the last, what is it, 13 years. Mm -hmm. And 
within the blink of an eye, whilst your mates are packing for schoolies, you're going to start pre-season. And, you know, I obviously had to move into state. I had to, um, you know, pack up, move out of home. Very happy to say that I was a mummy's boy who had no idea how to look after himself. Um, and, and then there's this whole drastic shift in the expectations of being a junior to being a senior footballer where, you know, you can turn up to, you know, the sport that perhaps you do or any of your friends do. And it, it's, it's joyful. It's fun. You're there to engage with other people. You're in there because you love the sport. And if you don't play, it's just your choice and that's it. If you don't play um, when you're a professional athlete, you don't get paid. So you're suddenly going to be stranded in this, you know, um, state that you've never spent any time in with no income. And I, I think the sort of just sheer amount of sort of moving parts uh, once you do get drafted was was probably the biggest thing that I, I struggled with. Mm. And as you said, you know, you're going from year 12 to then obviously playing professional league. Did you feel that you missed out on a lot of the years, like your young adult years that you wish that you did more of? Yeah, I mean, put it this way, I'm friends with all people who are like 10 years older than me. So, um, and that's by way of the fact that you have to grow up really quickly. And, and look, I didn't miss out on, you know, schoolies or, you know, bumming it around as a uni student. That wasn't what I wanted to do anyway. Um, and even if I'd gone into the, the workforce or gone into study, I'm sure I wouldn't have coasted through those years. But I think realistically what you do um, miss out on is trying to find that sort of um, autonomy in what you're doing every single day. Um, mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, like the, the structure of football is one of the best parts about it. But the reason why so many players struggle transitioning out of the game, and usually that's not on their own terms, usually it's when they've been told they're either not fast enough, fit enough or good enough. Um, that shock to the system of, oh, what am I going to do? not just, you know, this year, but today and in the next hour where traditionally you get sent out an incredibly detailed schedule. And in the downtimes, many footballers basically spend it, you know, playing PlayStation or, you know, going out for lunch or whatever it may be. Um, and it's certainly not seen as, or at least I didn't see it in my early days as this sort of block of time that I could improve my sort of external life outside of the game of football. And look, as my career progressed, I think that was the thing that was most apparent to me is that, the lack of ability to continue my studies effectively, the lack of ability to seek some sort of um, validation on that I was, you know, providing input or um, providing value to society or to the people that I worked with or the communities, whatever it may be, outside of the game of footy was almost impossible. And so you get sort of your focus narrowed down so specifically onto did you play well in the two hours a week that you play in front of 60,000 people? Mm -hmm. And that is like the number one best way to make your life very volatile because, you know, playing football is difficult. Even if you're one of the best players in the league, injury, form, you know, if you get good enough, everyone's going to try and stop you. Um, and so I think that was, yeah, I suppose as the years evolved, that was one of the things that became really, really obvious to me. Mm, do you feel like that's, because I think of that where you go, your worth then comes down to just that, that 90 minutes or that 120 minutes or however long you play, your worth and who you are as a person is determined by your performance on a field. Do you think that that's good and that's something that we should be just defining players as? Well, I must say you must be from the Northern States if you said 90 minutes because yeah. that's a bit of you are. Yeah, rugby league. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... I, I look, I think everyone does it to a degree. Um, whether you're doing the work that you do, whether you're doing, you know, you're an accountant or a lawyer or a tradie or whatever, like some part of who you are and the value that you provide to people and the value that you feel you provide to people is predicated on the work that you do. Mm -hmm. But the problem with football, for at least for me, was that all of the value and all of the lack of value that I provided came from one place. And as I went through my career and I, you know, went through a lot of struggles throughout the middle part, particularly before I decided to, to retire in 2019, once I got over that hump of 2017 in particular, and I'm sure we can, we can have a chat about that as well. But when I got through the worst sort of mental challenges that I faced, I started to build myself back up outside the game. So I started to invest in study. I started to invest in friends and family and sort of building out the repertoire of things that I do in my life, as opposed to just being this like fanatical overly obsessive and um you know to my own detriment um focused on football mm -hmm. and 
I think what that does is it gives you, to your point, lots of different areas that you can validate that what you're doing is the right thing because you're getting basically feedback from a much larger data pool of people. Whereas whilst it might seem ridiculous to think that there's more people to sort of engage with outside of the massive fan bases of these AFL clubs is they're kind of like a monolith. They all sort of just speak and talk at you in the same way. Um, one of the things I said to someone last week, I was at a, uh, uh, I just got announced as the foundation ambassador for the Western Bulldogs. So in a charitable role and um, someone said, uh, oh, do you miss it? Like, do you miss playing footy? And we'll sort of have a quick chat about it. I said, you know what the worst thing is, even now, it's when kids or like adults or whoever come up to you and they call you by your last name. It's like, when people call me Boyd, I'm like, it's so demeaning. Like, yeah. like, like you know, I'm sure you can work out what my actual name is. And, um, you know, I'd even be better if they called me by my nickname, like Boydy would be fine. But just Boyd has this sort of like cutting edge, you know, you're a piece of meat sort of um, mental yeah. attachment to it in my mind. And I think that's sort of endemic of the fact that that's how like fan bases treat the players who apply. And I'm not, again, this is not a, a, an assassination on the, the the fan bases. It's just the way that we're presented to them. We're yeah. packaged up on TV. We're, you know, most of the time shown in, in 2D or 3D, sorry, 2D. And, um, and the, you know, the, the sort of functional information that they receive is all sort of drip fed through a club approval process into the sort of broader media approval process and eventually to their ears. And, um, you know, I hated that. I hated that a lot. Um, and so once I was able to actually expand my horizons to deal with more people, I found myself getting much more external validation on the fact that, Hey, if I put the work in, I'm going to get the result that I actually want. Mm, and it's crazy to even look at the media and how fans can perceive you because one minute you're a hero, then one minute you can be a villain. Yeah, or both at the same time, which mm. I have experienced many times in my career. Mm. And it, it, yeah, I don't, it's just so, I mean, I think the statistics are there's 9,900 players, I should say, in the league or probably ticking up to 1,000 now. And there's double that that report on the, the AFL news. Mm. And like, that by definition means that most of the news is going to be rubbish because uh, everyone needs to have a job. And, you know, again, by definition, it means that most of the news stories that you see will be repeated. And also that, that again, was probably the thing that I found most challenging, which was all of a sudden, and they still do this to this day, is that because the industry is so repetitive and it's it's not so much about being interesting, it's about being on tune with what's being spoken about at the moment and giving your own input into the one topic that's captivating the football world. I was often that topic. So when things um, ramped up, it was like not only is one commentator saying something about me, but now a hundred or one newspaper, one radio station. And that obviously really leaves a severe imprint on the fan base of the club that you play for. And I think in my case, in many, many ways, I was lucky because the Bulldogs felt like that, you know, they should protect me. And I think that a lot of the fans felt the same too. And particularly after we won the premiership in 16, they felt like that, you know, I was going to be a part of the, the furniture forever, given that I'd you know, had success with the team um, at the at the top level. So, um, yeah, I did just think that over time, you just sort of get this strange warped sense of how people actually want to interact and engage with you because, you know, that's the experience that you have. Mm. Yeah, and, and we talk about then your experience at the Bulldogs. You were on a million dollar contract. I mean, that I feel would bring a whole lot of pressure in itself. Did you feel, and I know that a lot of players in this environment and in the sporting industry, we chuck large numbers at even young players and we set them up for so many years and they have to commit to this. Did you feel trapped at all being in that contract? Because what was it, seven years? $7 million, seven years. So um, for the listeners, the, the context of that contract was that I would have been the second highest paid player in AFL history at that stage, I think, to the best of my knowledge, um, behind Buddy Franklin. Um, funnily enough, who my manager negotiated the the year before. So Liam was in a good patch at that stage. Um, and and the other bit of context that's important is, you know, at, at the stage that when they offered me the deal, the Western Bulldogs, I was 18 and I played three three or four games of AFL footy. And to, your, to answer your question specifically, I think we all feel trapped by certain things in our work life in particular, or even in our, you know, social lives. I mean, 
the expectations of people and you know we spoke very briefly at the start about having a child i mean the expectation to turn up and she's there all the time you know more so than you can possibly anticipate which sounds stupid because it's obvious that a kid will always be there and need your support it's just that the sort of ongoing nature of having to turn up for her is different to anything that i've ever done before and i don't feel trapped by that but you know i know some people would and i know that some people would feel trapped by the fact that there is a obligation to provide for um you know anna and and rani for me um and i know that there's an obligation at certain workplaces to make sure that your team is on top of things or that the, your clients or whoever like this responsibility and the tension between feeling trapped and feeling like you actually are on top of things is kind of a you know it's quite a narrow ledge that we walk on i think at different stages and um, when you add into that, you know, this very public profile of, you know, there's plenty of people in Australia who earn really good money and, you know, have very difficult jobs and all that sort of stuff. But there's only a few, probably only a handful at any one time who earn money in the, the really public way that I was at that stage. And again, like very blessed to have been paid what I was. Um, very happy that I gave back over $2 million at the end to make sure that I can move on with the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, and, you know, very thankful for the experience that I had as an AFL footballer, but at the same, in the same breath, I can also say that within that time, I don't know many people who could have um, dealt with being paid such a large sum of money at the age of again, 18 and 19. And, you know, to have probably the most attention at least in that very short period for any 18 year old, perhaps that's ever played the game of AFL at that stage. So um, yes, I felt obligated and incredibly responsible to get the output that people wanted from me, given that I was getting paid so much. And I just didn't want to let anyone down. And I think that's a, you know, that's something that we all go through at different stages where we feel the, you know, desperate need to make sure that we don't disappoint people. Mm -hmm. and what that often does at least for me and you know what i've seen in others is that it makes people so focused on not disappointing them tomorrow but they forget about making sure that they're capable of not disappointing people in 12 months time um, mm -hmm. and that sort of running and running with your head down and white knuckling through every crisis that you see obviously comes back to bite you at different stages which it did for me um, and then you end up realizing that you know just try trying to you know, get people's approval in the, the short term, you know, it really costs your ability to get their approval in the long term. Mm. Did you feel then, though, that, you know, we start off talking about how when you play club footy, it's all fun and it's all with your friends and you started off just loving the game and wanting just to play the game and then you're thrown in money and you, you're thrown in that extra pressure on those contracts. Did you ever feel that you then started to fall out of love with the game because it became so serious? Yeah, for sure. I mean... <laughs> Um, the, when I walked away in 2019, I was 23. I had two and a half years, probably a little more on my contract, um, plus whatever contract that would have um, probably gotten after that if I had to guess, given particularly the position that I played. And, um, you know, I remember I went to, I was doing university at the time and I'd sort of really dove back in head first and was doing, I think, nine hours a week contact time. So I was doing Monday, Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, three hours Basically, I'd leave the footy club and then go straight to uni and, and work from six till nine and then have to do homework on top of that or assignments or whatever. And I was about to go into this lecture. Uh, I think it was entrepreneurship, I think it was, which, by the way, the fact that uni sell entrepreneurship as a, as a subject is like mind blowing to me. But anyway... Um, and I remember sitting there and I was, is undoubtedly would have been a boring lecture. Um, you know, the course that I did was pretty sort of mid-level, um, particularly because I did well at school and I'd sort of done a lot of the stuff that was in there already. It was just a mid-level business degree. And I, I was more excited to go in and listen to this rubbish lecture um, than I had been to, to be a part of the footy club in a long time. And, you know, I think a large part of it is, you know, when, when things are choice and we choose to do them um, and, you know, we get up every day and go, this is what I want to do. And, you know, on top of that, I don't feel like doing that, but I know that I want, you know, I will be disappointed if I don't do it later. Like that's what sport is when you're going through school. Um, when it shifts to every waking moment of every day and often every waking moment of every night, if you're not sleeping like I wasn't, um, it just, it completely shifts your mindset as to what this sort of thing means to you. Mm -hmm. And 
yeah, I just never could grapple with that. And I think it really, you know, at its heart or its core gets back to the fact that I couldn't deal with the fact that people just consider me a footballer and didn't, you know, um, spare any mind to the fact that I was just a person like everyone else. And again, massively blessed with all the things that I was given and, and granted and earned over a period of time. Um, but I made a distinct choice to go and do something different because I knew that the football sort of environment wasn't for me long term. Mm. Wow. And, and we look at that now transition, you're quite open about the, the mental health issues that you did struggle with during your playing career. At what stage did you feel it shifted or it started to change? Yeah, it's a, it was a pretty much a journey from, you know, start to finish in a way. I mean, I, I was in a good space when I retired. I was really sort of practical about where I was at. But, you know, in my first month in Sydney, I was having issues with sleep in particular. Um, and that didn't make a lot of sense to me because I'd slept well as a kid and, you know, I was doing, God, what, maybe 60 Ks a week on the training track, um, plus, you know, four or five sessions of gym, um, additional cardio, swimming, boxing, um, you know, meeting, like it's, it's exhausting and it's incredibly big of a step up from, you know, your junior days where, you know, I've done pre-seasons prior to that, but never to the point where I you know, didn't know who I was when I finished, I was that tired. Um, and again, to not sleep with that as well, you know, one of the things that really started popping up into my life was um, I just felt like nervous all the time. Um, it was like I was, uh, you know, when you drive at night and you sort of get over the hump of tiredness and then you like feel like you've had 50 coffees. <laughs> it was like that. And it was leaving me feeling really agitated. And I didn't realize that it was an issue with anxiety at the time. Um, but with those two things certainly made me feel sort of really uncomfortable in my own skin. And, and the natural thing for me to do was to go spend time by, by myself because I needed to recover. I couldn't handle the social component at that stage. And, you know, you're kind of done if you do, done if you don't, because at that stage, if I turned up to all the social things, gone for coffees, gone out for beers with the guys, all that sort of stuff, I would have been the worst person at the party to deal with anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and they would have all been like, oh, this guy's miserable. But then because I didn't go, they all thought that I was being standoffish or arrogant or didn't want to connect. And look, maybe that comes into it. I, again, I, I can't speak to the experiences of the people who were around me at the time, but I just know that I was in a really rough place. And, um, you know, again, it was sort of exacerbated by the fact that people thought I was doing it on purpose at that stage. And, um, you know, when I moved back to Victoria, I was very optimistic that, you know, maybe it was homesickness when I was away. Maybe it was this like sort of really easy to define and logical experience that I'd had. But, um, you know, when I moved back to Victoria, things just seemed to get worse. And and I think a large part of it was, you know, the stuff we've already spoken about. I think a large part of it was that I felt such a obligation to the people in the footy club and outside of it to not ever show that I wasn't having a good time or that I wasn't grateful in particular. Um, mm. And I think that's probably really at its core is like, if you're getting paid a lot of money, the last thing that you can do is basically say to people, oh yeah, but my life sucks. Because mm -hmm. you know that there's thousands and thousands of people who think that they would you know, do anything to get paid the amount that you're getting paid. Mm -hmm. And you know, what they don't understand, of course, is that they don't really understand the experience or the obligations or the responsibilities, all the externalities that come with these sorts of jobs. And in particular, the one that, you know, being it in the public eye as well. So you know, that really forced me backwards in terms of just continuing to ignore it, continuing to avoid it, hoping for, you know, a change that would magically come one day. Um, and again, I, you know, I probably went through the same mental thought process after the grand final. I was very optimistic that things would magically turn around, um, that the joy and success and relief and, you know, all of the great emotions I was feeling after being you know, part of that wonderful premiership would just, you know, linger forever. Um, but unfortunately, you know, things got drastically worse the next year and I found myself basically having not slept in you know, six weeks, I think I did in the end. Um, but I'd been through a cycle of sleeplessness basically for four years at that stage and it was sort of just the, the final sort of straw that broke the camel's back where I needed to actually take time off my job and, and come out and talk about what was going on. Mm. And can you explain to people that don't know how it works or doesn't don't know how it feels to have no sleep when it comes to, you know, going to bed at night or going to bed at a reasonable hour, what's rushing through your head? What's rushing through your body? Why can't you just sleep? Yeah, it was an interesting one. I mean, it changed 
like the actual experience changed over the years. I mean, the first one was when I was in Sydney um, after being drafted, it was very simple. It was just, I couldn't get to sleep. And I think everyone's been through that at some stage. We're just sort of racing thoughts and you're like, I'm exhausted, but now I'm thinking about this thing I've got to do on Thursday and it's Monday and it's like, doesn't make any sense. And uh, so often I would get to the stage where I sort of hadn't slept um, until say two in the morning or one in one in the morning. And, you know, we're up at six training. So the sort of sleep fatigue was really settling in. Mm-hmm. And so I think once I got tired enough after, you know, a few weeks or, or a month or two dealing with this, then it became, I can get to sleep, but I just keep waking up like every 15, 20 minutes I'm awake all the time, won't stop. Um, and that kind of is a harder one to explain because everyone's like, oh yeah, I, I, we've all had restless sleep, but like, I'm not sure that you get that. I'm like, you know, I haven't had any deep sleep in weeks or months or whatever it is. And I think that was sort of when my mood and the avoided stuff started at the, at the giants. But the, the reason I say it got drastically worse when I moved back to Victoria is um, I would go sort of cyclically through this sort of up and down throughout the week where I would basically not sleep after a main training session Thursday and then wouldn't sleep again after a main session on Friday. Uh, and then we'd play a game of footy in front of, you know, 50,000 people that Eddie had at the time. And then it's very common, particularly after night games for AFL footballers, and I'm getting, you know, most most sports people, I'd say, around the world to not sleep after those events. You've just got so much adrenaline and, you know, anxiety and concentration, all that sort of stuff. So now I'm like three days no sleep. And that is like, when I was going to bed then, that is like basically feeling like your heart's at 150 beats a minute for the entire night. And then you'd get over that and it, finally your body would just break. So you'd be like, I can sleep now. But that's when the depression really sort of started setting in because I was so exhausted. Um, and often if, you know, I played bad or or not good enough, which was, you know, very typical of me to not think that anything was good enough. Um, or if we'd been beaten or the coach was in a bad mood or whatever, um, you know, that's when things would be, you know, sort of really difficult for me mentally to, to get out of bed and, and deal with it. So then, you know, I'd get back to the club because I didn't have a choice, get through the start of the week, and then we'd just do that radio all over again. And that sort of went on and off. That happened throughout 2015 and 16 for large portions of it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then sort of it was just like sleep paralysis almost throughout 2017 where it was just no sleep at all. It was just sort of... I felt like every day was just getting worse and worse and worse. And eventually I had to do something and, and take some time off, which uh, was very important because, you know, the, the the actual function of not sleeping is, you know, you're grumpy or you're agitated, but eventually if you don't sleep for long enough, um, you know, your body starts breaking down. Like I was getting injured, I was getting sick, couldn't concentrate, couldn't have conversations with people. Like it was, I was a mess. So um yeah i think that was probably the driving symptom of of the mental challenges that i faced over the course of four or five years and how did you go then asking for help or saying like i need time off because i know that can be really hard for some people to be like hey i'm not okay i don't know what's going on but i just need to take a break yeah uh i didn't ask for a long time um and you know that's for all of those reasons you just mentioned the obligation to play and you know, is it really that bad? Is it bad enough? What's bad enough? You know, what's really bad? Like you just have no sort of sense of where you're at compared to others. And I think that's part of the problem. It's not really a comparison or moment for comparison in your life. It's much more about, you know, are you at an optimal state? How can you get back to there? Um, Because at the end of the day, like, you know, I wasn't better because I was stoic. I wasn't better at football or you know, better as a partner with Anna or anything like that whilst I was pretending like or avoiding dealing with the issues I was having. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, the the where I got to in, I think it was June 2017, was I'd essentially been in and out of the side with injury. So I'd had these soft tissue injuries, which, by the way, I mean, I'd never done a calf in my life, really. I'd never had a hamstring issue. And again, all this was sort of stemming from the fact that I was so tired and, and so fatigued. My body just couldn't possibly recover from the, the strain I was putting it under. And I remember they basically said, look, we just want you to get through one game in the reserves, one full game. You play four quarters, we're going to Perth next week or whatever it was. And I was like, there is no way I can get through a game because things were just getting worse and worse. And I I probably hadn't slept at this stage, I think probably about 10 10 days, maybe two weeks. And I remember just feeling like incredibly um, 
trapped and had, I had no idea what I was going to do because I, I couldn't, like, I'd done the, this conversation a thousand times and every time I'd eventually got to the stage where I was like, I just got to play. Like, I've just got to get up and go. And, go. And, I, and, you know, often it was a Thursday night that this would happen. I think this was a Thursday morning um, or maybe a Wednesday morning. And I was just, this time around, I was like, my body was in, you know, agony. Everything was hurting. My brain was, you know, in agony just as much or more. And I picked up the, uh, at, that phone, at that time, I picked up the phone and called the club psych, which again, you know, for all of the individuals that I've dealt with over the years working in this space, I mean, it's not usual for people to have someone like that to call, um, especially not that you can actually get onto mm-hmm. or that you don't have to book an appointment for. And, you know, obviously that's what, you know, being an ambassador for Lifeline is about on my part, which is making sure that people know they do have access to support in those sort of dark moments. And, you know, I spoke to her about basically, I said, look, I, I just, I can't play this weekend. There's no way I can get through a game. And we'd been speaking on and off at this stage, but really hadn't delved into the real sort of how bad it had gotten. Um, she knew more than anyone else, uh, except for probably Anna. And she just said, oh, how can I help? Mm-hmm. And the reason why that was so important, and, and it's so important to have someone who can actually ask that question when you're in that stage is, you know, particularly for someone who's getting paid a lot of money to be a public figure, there's a lot of things in the machine that, you know, are moving that if you jump out will sort of fall apart. Um, and if they don't fall apart, they've got to be sort of spoken to and addressed. And, and one of them was, you know, if I didn't play, what were we going to tell everyone? Because, you know, as soon as it's Tom Boyd's injured, they're like, well, what's he injured with? Or why is he not playing? And the sort of C-suite of the club at the time they said to me, oh, well, what do you want us to say to the media? We should, you know, we can just say that you've got personal reasons or family issues. And, and for whatever reason, I had some sort of um, semblance of uh, a working mind at that stage where I was like, why in the world would we lie about this? <laughs> Whilst I'm, you know, I've been absolutely gunned at by the media for the last two and a half years. And now we're going to lie to them when I'm struggling at my most in the hope that they're not going to dig into it and be like, oh, this guy's lying and make up a whole bunch of stuff. So I really wanted to explicitly let people know that the reason I was taking time off wasn't because I was sad or I was, you know, feeling sorry for myself or, you know, maybe I was a bit stressed. Like I couldn't play football. My, you know, my ankle and the shoulder reconstruction that I'd had and the back issues that I'd had, and the soft, like my body was just wasn't working. And if I couldn't play, well, then why not deal with it? all of the injuries that I'm facing, mental and physical at this stage to get back to being better. And, um, you know, that was why I was having it so important having Lisa, the club psychologist with me at that stage, because half the problem was just navigating all of the rubbish surrounding football, not just the game itself. Mm. And did you end up saying the truth in front of the media? Yeah, I came out, or I didn't, I, we did it in a statement, I think, but I came, uh, the statement read something like he's suffering from uh, clinical depression, insomnia and anxiety um, issues. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, to this day, I, I really hesitate on making it seem anything like I was a trailblazer in this issue, because I really don't intend to do that. Um, but there wasn't many players who'd ever spoken explicitly about what was going on, almost none in the AFL, at least at that stage. Um, there'd been some past players maybe and, and a couple of others who'd taken very brief stints and maybe just, you know, to the initial sort of statements that I mentioned around personal leave or family issues or whatever. They sort of said that something was going on, but it wasn't, you know, they didn't want to get into the detail. But I felt so obligated to make sure that the fan base and the, the club more broadly and the players knew that I wasn't copping out because I was you know, again, feeling sad and sorry for myself. Like this was had gotten really bad and really out of control. Um, And I think to this date, it was probably the best thing that I could have done. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it made my life harder in some ways because you kind of have to reprove that you're a mentally stable human afterwards, Mm -hmm. especially in the sort of Mm -hmm. football world. Not that anyone would admit that ever. Trust Mm -hmm. me, don't ask because they they won't tell you. (laughs) Um, But that's certainly part of it. And um I think it certainly held me in good stead for people just to understand a bit better about what experience I was going through and and understanding that it wasn't a cop-out, but much more a, hey, I need to fix this now, otherwise I don't know what's going to happen next. 
Mm. And then coming back, I, I want to talk about this because I did hear you speak about it in a podcast where you felt that when you, you came back and you admitted that, you know, you were dealing with some issues that were mentally challenging and then you felt like sometimes other people had the mentality when you did come up with another issue or I didn't have enough time off that, or what is it with him now? What else has he got wrong? And I feel that some people do experience this, that once they've been brave enough to even admit that they're struggling or going through some sort of mental health issue, that then when they bring something up again or when they talk about, oh, I'm not having a good day, someone will step in or someone will judge or they'll have a thought of, oh, what's wrong with them now? And how did that make you feel in that moment, knowing then that, you were then almost labelled or judged every time that you were struggling or still struggling with it. Yeah, it wasn't all the time. There was one issue in particular that I think I would have been referencing, which was, um, you know, I come back and I'd played some footy at the end of 17. So I'd sort of had some time off then come back and played in the reserves. And I came back and played AFL footy the next year and had some good games, had some, you know, some average ones too, of course. But, you know, on, on, um, on volume, you know, looked like a pretty solid season, I would say. Um, and then basically at the end of the year, I hurt my back. Um, and, you know, this had been an issue that had been getting worse and worse and worse throughout the year. I'd been having a, a heap of issues. And, you know, this was a genetic issue that I, my first injury on this back problem was in 2011 when I was 15. So um, hardly like a made up story about, you know, issues that I'd had. And quite honestly, you know, I think the club probably should have known more about it, given that, um, you know, I'd had so many issues over the years. And and it wasn't in the initial stages. I mean, it was quite obvious that I was having issues with it. Mm -hmm. I think the concern as it went on was like, there was some conversations and some expectations of me to go and, you know, basically get mentally screened afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, that was fine. I mean, to just to com confirm that that was the case, that I wasn't, you know, mentally struggling and taking time off because of my back. And I mean, like, I was in agony. I was barely being able to move. You know, I had basically six months where I couldn't train at all. Mm. I think that is probably endemic of the fact it's like, if they're not directly questioning, is he faking it? They're questioning or at least doing their due diligence to ensure that they're crossing their their um their t's and dotting their eyes and i think that's partially because of the cost of the contract mm -hmm. um but i was very very firm with them um following on from 17 that i, I wasn't having mental challenges I, I dealt with many of them i felt like i was sleeping better um and i was certainly you know working very hard at making sure that i could keep myself in a good place um mentally but my back was broken in the sense that it just wouldn't work. And it still has never recovered from that. Like I still have issues with it till this day and I will have them for the rest of my life. And mm. um, yeah, I suppose I was confident enough then to make sure that they, yeah, try whether they were trying to use it as a, you know, a reasoning behind why it was sore. Um, you know, I can confidently say that even now it's still exactly where it left off. And, and a large portion of it was because I began to ruck by myself for a lot of 2018. So um, yeah, I think it's challenging for everyone. And and that's why I look, oh, my my general perspective is if you're not in a, you know, public facing job, um, I bluntly encourage you obviously to get support that you need, but I don't think you need to make it everyone's business. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's mechanisms within the workplaces these days that do give you a sense of being able to actually go and support yourself and, and there are you know anonymous ways to do that i'm certainly not being a proponent of hiding it from everyone but i just think that it's only relevant um, to the workplace if it is really impacting your work and that you need to get work to work with you so many works in that sentence mm -hmm. um but you know again to get back to the reason i had to be public about it was because you know if i missed one thing you know the world would know and i think that's a drastically different situation to what most people find themselves in absolutely and and looking at your career then you you know had that little break and then you came back and played but then you did end your contract and you didn't see it out what encouraged you to make that decision was it more the physical side of things it was certainly part of it um and, and look I was in a good place when I retired but I sensed that if I continue to go down the path of having a back injury that I just couldn't fix and again like injuries that people can't see are very difficult to deal with um, mental or physical and backs are one of them um so 
to sort of get to the point where I was starting to look ahead. I'd had a lot of um, sort of uh, work and interest and, you know, um, opportunities, I suppose, to work in the mental health space at that stage. And I felt like that it was something I was really passionate about. It felt like something I could make an impact in into, you know, one of the original conversations we had, it was something that I felt like I could provide the world with an impact that I was able to be validated on as being really positive. Uh, and if I worked harder at it, I found that I got better at it. Um, and that, you know, engaging with people was something that I've really, really enjoyed. And I'd basically shied away from that my entire career because I felt so, you know, either disappointed or embarrassed at times that I wasn't performing to the level that people wanted me to. Um, and then to get to the point, so, you know, basically at the end of 2018, I spoke to the club doctor and I, you know, I've been injured for maybe five months or something at this stage, four or five months I'd spent on the sideline. Mm -hmm. And we'd had an off season, which I'd had, you know, very compromised off season, you know, whilst you're supposed to be on holiday, um, you know, I was basically looking after my back and struggling to move and all that sort of stuff. Um, I spoke to the club doctor that stage and said, man, I don't want to do it anymore. Like I'm, I'm ready to give it away. And he goes, what do you mean? What do you want to give away? I said, everything. I'm, I'm going to quit footy. I'm going to retire. And he said, Tom, I've seen this way too many times. I've seen, you know, guys who are in rehab, injured, unable to play, pull the pin and change everything because they just have lost this sense of identity as a footballer. Mm -hmm. And they always regret it. He said, so do me a favor, come back, get into the side. Um, and what, if you do that and you still want to retire, then I think it's, you know, it makes much more sense. And, I came back probably, oh, I don't know, maybe a few rounds into 2019 in the BFL. Um, and I reckon as soon as I walked out in the field, I was like, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't want to be here anymore. I just, I'd lost the edge that you need to be really successful at the top level. Um, and, you know, I, I had a very acute sense that if I just stayed, stayed there and, you know, took the money that I'd be ruining other players' careers. I'd be losing money for other people. The fan base would turn on me eventually. You know, my teammates would turn on me eventually, even the ones that I was close with, if I if they felt like I was, you know, um, you know, taking them for a ride, taking the club for a ride. And many of the relationships that I really valued in my life would have turned sour as well if I didn't, you know, be authentic to to what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as I said, you know, sitting in that car park, you know, the one thing that I realised was that I wasn't going to fight on the money. Um, I wanted to give it back. I didn't feel like I'd earned it. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know I wanted to walk away with a clean slate and I was lucky enough to get some time to go back and present to the footballers and the, and the support staff uh, to say goodbye in a retirement speech of sorts and you know I've been really blessed in my time at the footy club to see some of the legends of the club you know been there for 15 years 16 17 years retire and they often had this big you know speech that was written out and you know they wanted to make sure they thanked everyone and all that sort of stuff and you know I hadn't been there long enough to earn that um, and they had uh, and I respected that uh, in particular. So I didn't want it to be something like that. So I only came in and I said two things. I said, um, firstly, uh, to everyone who's in the room, um, thank you. Uh, you're the reason I'm being here this long, not the reason I'm leaving. And the second one was to all the players, if you're thinking about renegotiating your contract, now would be a really good time because the salary cuts just opened up or something like that. And, you know, the room laughed. Um, it took them a little bit to realise that they didn't have to be super serious. It wasn't going to be super sad. Um, and, you know, that was a really nice way to finish my career. I mean, most players don't get to walk out with players smiling and, mm -hmm. you know, your future wife on your arm and, and then opportunities, um, you know, to choose from and a passion that you're really excited about ahead of you. And, um, yeah, the last few years have been sort of tumultuous based on all the things that the world has experienced. But, you know, I've never sort of sat here and regretted the decisions that I made. Amazing. And walking away as well, knowing that you made that choice to walk away from the game, I feel that... That can be hard in itself, knowing, you know, a lot of times people either make a decision for someone else or even most of your career, you're saying that you've made decisions based on never disappointing anyone else and to finally make this decision for you um, and knowing it's the right one for you. Congratulations on that because a lot of people can't do that. Yeah, and I mean, we all do this, like whether we want to admit it or not, but we all get up every single morning and we go, it is subconsciously or consciously, is this worth it? Like, is it worthwhile getting up and doing this work? Because, it, you know, it's often a balance of income and passion and, you know, growth and, you know, the future life. There's a thousand inputs to it, but the other crux of it is, do I actually want to do this? Um, and for me, you know, that question had always been, yes, that it was worthwhile continuing on. Um, but eventually that sort of pendulum had swung to the point where I didn't feel like it was worth it anymore. 
Mm. And again, like, you know, one of the things that I make sure people understand, I didn't retire because I wanted to sit at home and or go on a beach. I didn't have that much money. Um, you know, the tax man is very, very strict on our football balls for starters. <laughs> Um, but it was because I was passionate about the next step in my career. And I think that is another thing that I learned. And I, I spoke to Chris Anstey, who used to play, um, you know, basketball at the, the national level as an Olympian for us. He said to me, the sport is the only career that you do that you have to retire when you finish at the age of 23 or 25 or 30. So the rest of the people in the, you know, the rest of the world just say that they're changing jobs. Yeah. And that's a really important thing for me, which was I was changing jobs. And I think that many players get caught in, caught up into the fact that they're retiring, which is by definition a really crappy place to be with 30 years of life or 30 years of your working life ahead of you or 40 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could stand, um, you know, confidently saying that I was doing what I wanted to do and that I was still going to contribute. I was going to push myself to improve. Many of the qualities and traits that I've learned over the years as a footballer were still going to come out. Mm -hmm. It was just going to be funneled into a different um, sort of set of circumstances. Mm, and which then leads on to you writing a book. Um, congratulations on that. That is absolutely phenomenal. How did that come about? Why did you want to write a book? Yeah, it was. Um, I think it was something that I was always interested in. Um, I did really well at English at school. And, um, you know, again, to be explicit, I actually wrote this book. So amongst mm. all of the sporting heroes who have much more interesting stories than mine. Um, one of the distinct differences is that, you know, Nowhere to Hide um, is, a, is a book that I wrote myself, um, certainly with some help. But um, yeah, every word that you've seen in there is came off my keypad at some stage. And I think the real reason was, um, you know, whilst COVID was a horrible experience for many people, and it certainly wasn't an enjoyable one um, for me at different stages, uh, what it did do for me was really sort of forced me to consider what the complexion of work I wanted to do in my life was. So once I finished in 2019, I had some people basically come and ask me if I could come and share my story at schools, if I could, you know, speak and do the sort of speaker circuit. And, um, you know, it was, wasn't something I'd thought about, but, you know, quite quickly I found that you know, it was really appealing to me um, and that I got quite good at it quite quickly. Um, I actually spoke to someone the other day who said they li listened to me speak in my first ever gig and they said it was really good. And I said, I, I, I certainly didn't get that impression when I left um, in terms of like how I felt about it. It was all a bit of a, a blur at that stage. But leading into 2020, I'd sort of gotten to the stage where I had probably, you know, 50 or 60 gigs lined up. It looked like that was going to be enough to sort of bridge income. And, you know, I was going to be, pa I, I had space to do other things and, and then, of course, COVID hits and, um, you know, that all disappears in about, you know, two hours or a day. Um, and so I was kind of put into a position where, you know, I wasn't going to go broke tomorrow, um, but I had some expenses that I need to pay and some things coming up. So, um, and, and more than that, actually, beyond anything, um, the issue that I had was I had too much time. Um, I had all this time that was given back to me because now I wasn't commuting, now I wasn't speaking, now I wasn't playing footy. Um, which I'd signed up to do in 2020. I didn't have time to catch up with people. Like, again, the whole breadth of my life had just disappeared, much like it had for many. And so I started to think about, you know, what I'd sort of been through previously in life and all that sort of stuff. And what I realised was that I wasn't quite done with all of the things that had happened during football and all these mental challenges I'd faced. And so as painful as it might be, I felt like the right thing to do was start um, to sort of journal a lot of the things that have happened, how it had happened, when it had happened, all that sort of stuff. Mm. And so I sort of got together probably 60 to 70,000 words and we presented it at the end of 2020 to uh, um, Alan and Unwin who ended up publishing it and a couple of others. And, um, you know, their feedback was great. This is, you know, this is a really interesting story. Let's start again. Um, and so whilst painful, I had to sort of redo another 120,000 words or whatever, of course, in the course of 20. <laughs> Uh, 2021 but um you know what i found was that you know when we have conversations like this as you know deep and sometimes dark the topics can be they are still it's still a conversation um mm -hmm. likewise when you speak in front of people though it's you know it, it can be difficult to share some of your sort of more vulnerable experiences you don't dwell on them as much i find it's sort of just you know i can say to you i didn't sleep for three weeks and then i can go on to the next thing mm -hmm. when you're writing um it's particularly when you're trying to understand the emotion behind many of the things that you went through, you really have to delve into it and sit in the sort of the challenge 
uh, and emotion and, and shame and disappointment and frustration and, and fear and all that sort of stuff. And I found that to be the most challenging. You know, you'd sort of stare at the screen for 20 minutes and then um, not write a thing and then suddenly you'd write for eight hours. Um, mm-hmm. And so it was a really sort of um, enjoyable experience in the sense of getting out the other side of it was good. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it sort of had its moments during during the year where banging my head against a computer screen for a few hours at a time was was not too enjoyable. Writing is hard. You either got it or you don't. And it's like you can have little sessions where you can just pump out so many words and then you can just have nothing. You're just in drought. Yeah. I don't, I think that's more so, I must say, I think that's more so with when you're writing a story, it's Mm -hmm. like that. I think when you're writing about experiences that have already happened and it's more like detailing them, it's I didn't find that I couldn't write. It's just that I found that I had to go through this sort of emotional roller coaster mm. to get the accuracy behind what I was saying. Mm. Um, and remember details and do some research on just lining up memory versus reality. And then, yeah, I think that was the the difficult part. Mm. And then what do you want people to take away from your book? I do enjoy this question because I don't I didn't set out trying to think about um you know what to take away but when i when i got to the end of it i think what i realized was that the thing that i did worst in my career was that i always thought that because i was unique um and because i'd had such a unique career whether that be the money or the the fame or the you know the draft pick or the success as a premier player whatever it was like the combination of things in my career has genuinely never happened before and probably won't ever happen again Mm -hmm. Um, having said that, you know, the experiences that I had, the questions that I asked myself, the fears and doubts and frustrations and all the emotions that I mentioned before and and more are very similar to what most people go through. Um, and what we do as people, and I I don't think this is, uh, you know, unique to me is we go, yeah, but if that person over there has got this type of life, well, they, of course they're happy. Or if they've got this job, you know, of course they're happy or, you know, why wouldn't that person who's playing football for a living be happy? And mm-hmm. I think what that does to us is it just narrows our capacity to actually learn from each other so much. And mm-hmm. I think it is an Australian thing to a degree. I mean, we do have a very sort of tall poppy syndrome culture. And, um, you know, I think at times that really um, reinforces humility, which is a good thing, but it also sort of silos us, silos us all off from each other. Um, and so I think just working out that if someone is, you know, lucky as I was, um, you know, who was paid as much as I was, who was you know, successful in his job, um, successful as a, a, a kid, um, you know, good family, great partner, uh, genuinely living the dream um, at the age of 21 can go through the just sheer dark places that I went through, then I think it's pretty clear that, that anyone can. Mm-hmm. Um, and then hopefully that you know, anyone who feels like that they, they can't talk about it or deal with those issues um, feel slightly more comfortable uh, having read my story. Amazing. And do you still feel like you struggle today at all with whether it be anxiety, depression or just that flood of emotion? Yeah, I would, the way, how I would describe it is um, I don't have uh, an anxiety issue. I don't have a depression issue. I don't have sleep issue. I don't have any of those really big issues that I once had. Um, now, do I have bad days? We all have bad days. Um, do I feel anxious at times? Of course. Many, many times before I'm supposed to be doing something uh, important to me. And I think just, you know, one, learning about those emotions and making them more a part of my everyday life has been very useful. Um, but I think ultimately the difference between then and now is that I'm just much better at turning things around quickly. I mean, I rarely let a bad you know, morning turn into a bad day. Um, and look, it's not always a great day, but it's just not as bad as it would be otherwise. And I think, you know, in a sense, my lack of ability to ask for help or, you know, address the issues really just, you know, let myself succumb to them most of the time when I was, when I was really struggling and I was younger. Whereas now I feel like there's sort of, you know, what would be considered resilience in some way is just the ability to decide that you're not going to let those things take over um, your life. And I think, yeah, that's been a, a really big shift for me. Awesome. And you, you talk about obviously stepping away from the game was a big relief in helping that situation. But was there something for you that really did help your recovery through those really dark times? 
Yeah, I mean, we all want a silver bullet, and I think there are very good tools out there. I mean, meditation was certainly part of my um, experience, not so much now. Um, certainly exercise, but given that I was playing football for a living, it was kind of like, a, you know, par for the course. Um, and, and certainly there was other ones. I mean, therapy was a big part of it. I spent a lot of time with Lisa, the psychologist. Ultimately, what I think is that, you know, the crux of the thing that I was dealing with was just this issue around trying to find a bit of balance um, and trying to find, to your point earlier, around the, the validation, if we just put it from one part of our lives, it gets very difficult, um, particularly if we're in very challenging and very volatile environments like professional sports. So for me to be able to just, you know, reinforce and build out the Tom the person piece rather than just Tom the footballer over time was, is, was and is the biggest part of it. Um, you know, I know that I have really good intentions. I know that I try my, my best and I know that sometimes I don't, you know, get to where I want to get to. And sometimes I fail and that's fine. Um, but when I was playing football and all I was focused on, um, was just getting the outcome on the field. It wasn't fine and it never was going to be fine. So, um, just trying to find my ability to, you know, control what I can control, uh, put myself in positions where I can influence the people that I want to influence and, um, you know, leave the rest to, to fight, I suppose. Awesome. And and looking back at little Tom, um, if he was playing, yeah, little, yeah. I mean, tall Tom, sorry, we did establish that at the start, that does not play 90 minutes. Um, looking back at Tom, what would you say to him if, you know, you were a coach or if you saw him or you were around him and knowing what you know now, what message would you send him knowing that he was struggling? Ask more questions. Um, yeah, learn from other people more. I, I think the, you know, a lot of the siloed nature of my young life was done out of fear and insecurity. And I'm sure it manifested in overconfidence at times, but I was just never capable of asking people to help me. Um, I never felt like they, they should. I didn't feel like burdening them. I didn't feel like they'd understand what was going on anyway. And, you know, whether that be on the football field or whether that be in life, I think, um, you know, that certainly was the biggest hindrance. But, you know, a lesson that I had to learn the hard way and one that I've certainly held on to to this day. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story. And as we know, uh, Tom is an ambassador for Lifeline, so there is help out there. So even if you can't talk to someone that you love or someone that is close to you, know that there are services out there that We'll be there to pick up the phone and listen. So sometimes that's all we need. So thank you so much, Tom. Congratulations on your amazing journey to see that where you started to where you are now and how you actually are making a difference in not just your own lives, but so many people's lives. And I'm sure the community is very grateful for all the work that you're doing now. So thank you. No, thank you. Thanks for having me on.